I'm World Cup champion Megan Klingenberg. Wondering who you should root for at the FIFA Women's World Cup? I'm hosting a new podcast, my new favorite, Pupalista, where I will introduce you to soccer's brightest stars and the causes they are championing. From the 22-year-old American phenom speaking out about student-athlete mental health. I try to just like approach everything with like you don't know what someone's going through. To the U.S. defender who travels to tournaments with her young son. Am I ever going to be able to run for five minutes straight? Check out my new favorite Futbolista wherever you listen to podcasts. Edit audio. And our captain, six foot from the University of Connecticut, number 24, the Beast of Daddy. This is Rebound Revolution, a not-so-basketball podcast bringing you the revolutionary on and off the court happening in the WNBA. From queer baddies to history to ones to watch, join me, Money, as we get into it all. Welcome to Out of Bounds, where I bring you a little something extra from the recent WNBA news. We'll get into game recaps, some light gossip, like which exes are playing against each other, iconic style moments, and so much more. One thing we know about the W is that the players be playing as much off the court as they do on the court. So thankfully, we always have some new moments and gossip to bring you. But before we get out of bounds and jump into the most recent spicy moments in the W, I have a favor to ask y'all. So we are sadly nearing the end of this season of Rebound Revolution. But we do want to let you know that we will be back. (laughs) And we're looking for a listener to be on the next season of the show. If you're a longtime W fan, start it from the bottom, if you will. (laughs) We want to hear from you. I would love to speak to someone who's been through it all with the W. (laughs) So if that sounds like you or someone you might know, let's connect. And just as a call out, shout out to BJG, who left a review. BJG, if you're out there, we would love to talk to you. (laughs) You can email us at hello at editaud.io. Okay, that's H-E-L-L-O at E-D-I-T-A-U-D dot I-O. Woo, our email be tearing me up, (laughs) y'all. But yes, we want to speak to a longtime W fan. So if that's you, somebody you know, or if you're BJG, hit us up. Let's start inbounds with some recaps and recent iconic moments on the court. How could I start with anything else than Asia Wilson's 53 points against the Atlanta Dream? Oh my gosh. So first of all, I need to apologize to Asia because I forgot when we talked about bigs on the podcast that Asia Wilson is a center. And the reason why I forgot is because she'd be doing stuff like this, scoring 53 points in a game (laughs) and is everywhere on the court. And I think her coach said something like she runs like a deer, like she is so fast and can get from one end of the court to the other so quickly that I just be forgetting that she's actually a center because she is so fast. But this 53 points performance in Atlanta tied the record for most points scored in a WNBA game. Shout out to Asia for tying that record. I'm pretty sure she's got a 60 piece in her and that this record won't hold very long. (laughs) Now I'm going to move it on up to Minneapolis, Minnesota, with Nafisa Collier. Now, I feel like a lot of eyes were on Fee at the beginning of the season because she had a baby in the off season, and because her like mentor and teammate, Sylvia Fowles, retired. She was kind of like the most seasoned player for everybody to look to who had been on the team the longest. And y'all, Nafisa has not disappointed. She became the first player in WNBA history with back-to-back 20 points, 15 rebounds, and three assists games. 
And I just need to put a side note with these um, stats. Actually, her last six games have been double-doubles, and she's been playing her behind off on that court, okay? (laughs) In the conversation of valuable players, like, the Lynx would not look like the team it is without Nafisa Collier. And so, shout out, Fee! (laughs) Coming back from that baby, giving double-doubles on them. (laughs) The Lynx also clinched a playoff spot with this win. Now, the unicorn herself, Satu Sabali, is having an epic season, okay? I don't know what Satu did in the offseason, but she came back (laughs) to show y'all, all all right? My sister is not the only one that should be in conversations about a super team, okay? Because I'm scoring 40 points against the Indiana Fever, my team. (laughs) And this game clinched the Dallas Wings a playoff spot. I really think Satu is having a breakout season. You know, everybody's been posting about her. I think people have been noticing how good she is for the first time this season with these points she's been scoring. But I don't think that she should be in this conversation about most improved player. And I only say that because Satu has always been good. (laughs) Like... Yes, 40 points is, like, an epic feat in basketball, but, like, Satu ain't never been no slouch. Satu ain't never been no bench rider. She's, like, y'all, she's been good. Y'all just started paying attention, okay? So give the unicorn her things. (laughs) And speaking of people who should get their things, y'all know I had to shout out Alyssa Thomas for, like, a whole segment (laughs) on a previous episode. But... The engine has done it again. That's right. Connecticut Suns, Alyssa Thomas, got yet another triple-double, making it her sixth of the season. (laughs) And I was looking at the recap of this game because I actually missed it. It was almost a quadruple-double, y'all. Now, y'all remember when we talked about double-doubles, triple-doubles, It's when you get double-digit points in two, three, or four of the major five stats categories in basketball. This is really hard to do. It means you have to be everywhere on the floor. It means your teammates have to trust you. You have to trust your teammates. I think Alyssa Thomas racking up these triple-doubles just tells us how much She is the go-to person for the Connecticut Sun. She seems to be like the heart of the team. And she's so quiet. She's like a really quiet, you know, uh, like out of the spotlight player. But you don't get these kind of stats by not being the go-to or the heart of your team. Now, just to remind y'all, AT holds the WNBA record for most triple doubles in a single season, with six, but I honestly think that she's going to break her own record because the Sun are headed into the playoffs. She has more (laughs) games to rack up more triple-doubles, and I think she could easily do it. She also, in this same game, broke Courtney Vandersloot's record for most assists in a single season. So that means (laughs) she passes the ball to one of her teammates, and they score. Now, Courtney Vandersloot held this record for a long time. I think Courtney Vandersloot is arguably the best assist player in WNBA history. And then here come Alyssa Thomas, like, I would like a word. (laughs) So uh, shout out to the engine. You know, we love you over here on Rebound Revolution. And as the season winds down, There's been chatter. You know, everybody is throwing out their guesses for end-of-the-year awards, whether that's Defensive Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, MVP of the regular season, Coach of the Year, and Most Improved Player. I feel like I don't really have guesses because everybody has been so freaking good this year. But let me know if you have any guesses for who's going to win which end-of-season award. We heard you loud and clear. You love the WNBA and want more analysis and insight on your favorite players. 
Welcome to Queens of the Court, an Odyssey original podcast. I'm your girl, Cheryl Swoops. And I'm Jordan Robinson. All season long, we'll be bringing you the post-game analysis that you crave and sitting down for interviews with athletes across the W. You can listen to Queens of the Court on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's get back out of bounds where we belong in this <laughs> mini-sode and leave the stats talk to, you know, some of the professionals who get paid to do that. <laughs> so, y'all, the end of this season got spicy. There were scuffles and kerfuffles on the court almost every game. I don't know what happened after, like, the mid-season, but people... We're getting into it. So some of our faves, Brittany Sykes, who I think should win Defensive Player of the Year. I'm going to just say it. Brittany Sykes <laughs> and Laisha Clarendon Lay, one of our faves, one of the first players I talked about on this podcast, got into a scuffle. And then, like, maybe days, might have even been the same day, <laughs> in a game, Odyssey Sims. And Dana Evans, again, two faves. I love the Chicago Sky. Y'all know we did a whole episode on Chicago Sky. <laughs> Odyssey Sims has been one of my faves to watch play ever since her Baylor days. These two get into a scuffle, chest to chest. <laughs> and then, not too long after that, Aja Wilson... And I, I'm going to say it wasn't Aja Wilson versus anybody, even though Kayla Thornton is the one who fouled her. It was Aja Wilson just being fed up. <laughs> she was just tired of, like, not getting calls. And I think this is actually a really important moment. Everybody kind of harped on the fact that, you know, her coach ran to hold her back and her whole team was, like, holding her back. But I actually don't think it was about you know, them thinking that Asia was going to go run down Kayla Thornton. <laughs> I think it was a moment where they all realized that even in a contact sport like basketball, there are biases. So she doesn't get as many calls because she's 6'4", because she's brown skin, because of all the things that happen to Black women in particular bodies off the court they happen on the court, too. And it seemed like Asia was just frustrated and fed up with it. Like, I am obviously being fouled and somebody needs to call this. Like, I could get hurt. It looked like there were folks talking to the refs on the side. Like, yeah, that definitely has to be called. And she got her, you know, she got her justice. <laughs> you know, we talked about that 53-point game she has. So, Asia gonna be all right. But she was just fed up that day. <laughs> Now, I love to see my faves playing with aggression, playing with sass, playing with spice, just as much as the next person. I mean, I went and got one of those Kalia Copper hoodies of that moment between her and Sophie Cunningham. But I never, ever want to see anybody hurt. And speaking of the Aces and not seeing anyone hurt, the news about Raquana Williams from the Aces facing five felony domestic assault charges against her partner was gut-wrenching. I have so many thoughts about this situation, being a WNBA fan, a licensed marriage and family therapist in my day job, and being a lesbian. But I'm going to try to sum them up here and keep my thoughts as like least triggering as I can. But I just do want to give a content warning for the next few minutes for intimate partner violence. Okay, so two things that I just really wanted to say in this Out of Bounds segment about this situation with Raquana. First, there's a difference between harm and abuse. Harm refers to the impact an action has on somebody, while abuse can be an action or inaction and always has the element of power and control. I'm trying to think of an example to explain this that isn't too heavy because we live in such a violent world, y'all. <laughs> so I had a professor use this metaphor before, so let me see if I could recreate it. Harm would be me stepping on your foot. It hurts whether I meant to do it or not. My actions caused you pain. Abuse 
would be me stepping on your foot in a crowded train, knowing you can't move away from me doing so, and continuing to stand on your toes. There's intent there. There's a commitment to me hurting you. It's prolonged. But I also hold power in the way that I have the ability to stop, but I have no intention of stopping. Also, I can move. I'm standing and you can't. I'm exploiting some imbalance of power between us. I think this is a really important distinction because while abusers cause harm, not all harm doers are necessarily abusers. I think this is really important for us in figuring out like how to respond to violence when it happens. Deshaun L. Harrison has an amazing blog post about this distinction. If y'all want to go read it, they talk about how not treating all harm as abuse is actually pretty revolutionary because it's the opposite of how the prison treats harm, like the prison industrial complex treats harm. And also how we can have a community response to both harm doers and abusers. And we've linked that blog post from Deshaun in the description. Okay, secondly and lastly, this is the last thing I want to say about the Raquana Williams news. While rates of intimate partner violence are lower for same-gender couples, it is equally as serious. So according to a study done by the CDC, about 41% of heterosexual women will experience contact violence from a partner in the course of their lifetime. While a study done by Longabardi and their research colleagues in 2017 showed that about 35% of same-gender couples report intimate partner violence. So lower, but still significant. That's like a third. And from my perspective, any percentage is too much. But I noticed that the way people respond when intimate partner violence happens in a lesbian couple is almost as if they're like spectators watching a quote unquote cat fight instead of actually witnessing abuse, which is what's happening. Same gender or queer relationships are not taken seriously when they are framed in this way. Our partners are folks we love and have intimacy with, and our relationships are not just spectacle for non-queer people to watch. I will leave it there. This was heavy to mention, but we want to cover the fullness of players' humanities on this podcast. And the W isn't exempt from the problems of the world. This is Rebound Revolution, and the revolutionary thing to do is to not sweep things under the rug. Whew. All right. Grounding activity real quick. Take a deep breath. Inhale. And as you exhale, I want you to imagine what you would wear to a WNBA playoff game. Would you come through looking like you're going to Renaissance World Tour? (laughs) Fully visualize the outfit that you would wear to a WNBA playoff game. Now, whatever you've pictured, I'm sure is not as fly as the Obuma case, okay? Can we get into the fashion that has been happening at the end of this season? So I mentioned the Agumake sisters of the LA Sparks, Neka and Chanae, doing these coordinated sister fits earlier in the season in the Courtney Williams episode. Y'all, they made my wish come true because I told y'all I wanted to see more of this from them. I don't know if they hired a stylist or if they just be in each other's closets before games, but the two of them in these tunnel fits, oh my gosh. I've been so excited. I like squeal every time I see them on Instagram. (laughs) One of my faves was definitely the all silver outfits they did a la Renaissance World Tour, right? (laughs) They definitely understood the silver assignment of the summer, and they just look incredible. I said that they look like a basketball Chloe and Holly before, and I really, I'm sticking to that. The way that they each still have their individual styles, like, you know, Chanae is very flowy and girly, and Neka has more of, you know, like the shorts on or like the tomboyish aesthetic with her locks. I don't know how they do it. 
to have like such different styles, but also coordinated outfits. But I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I hope that mm, if they make the playoffs, <laughs> that we get to see even more fire in those tunnels. And, you know, in the spirit of Renaissance, it's Virgo season. You know, I might be your favorite Virgo. <laughs> But some of my favorite Virgos did not come to play with their birthday walk-in fits, okay? We know Kalia Copper is a fashion girly. Like, I talked about this before on the podcast. But the multiple birthday outfits, she just outdid herself. (laughs) I loved it. I loved the rollout of the outfits on Instagram, (laughs) the tunnel walk-in. It was amazing. Also, Natasha Howard, she was like, this is the way a championship player drips on her birthday, okay? (laughs) And the thing I love about us Virgos is when we get into something, we commit. And Natasha Howard's head to toe, like, same print. I don't even know where people find this stuff. Is it custom? Like, do you find the shirt and then go get the shoes and the hat that match the same print? I don't know. This is a level of fashion that I'm going to leave to Courtney Mays. <laughs> but I just think that Natasha Howard's birthday look was everything. And of course, the Washington legend herself, Elena Deladon, fellow Virgo, just came through with the athleisure beautiful birthday outfit and I love it. I love when it looks like, oh, this old thing, but you can tell, you can just tell (laughs) that a lot of time was spent. You know, that's what Elena gave us and I just lived for it. So shout out to the Virgos for coming through with their birthday outfits. On WNBA Twitter, speaking of this fashion moment, there's also been a lot of chatter of who should get a shoe next. I, as y'all have heard, am not a shoe girly, so (laughs) I really don't have much skin in this conversation. What I will say, though, is that every time I hear how few WNBA players have had shoe deals or have been the face of a shoe a basketball sneaker drop or whatever, I'm just always flabbergasted. Like, <laughs> like I assume these people have had shoes and they really haven't. So I think the past year has really been like Brianna Stewart and Candace Parker's shoes have been kind of like the big talked about shoes. I can't believe that Asia Wilson doesn't have a shoe already. I just can't believe that Arike Ogumba Wale, who... The detail in her shoes and, you know, the following that she has gained, not just because she's an amazing basketball player, but also because of the, like, fluid gender presentation, tomboy, accessorized looks on Instagram. She's built a following because of her looks. (laughs) You know, she be serving us. I can't believe she doesn't have a sneaker yet. So my answer to who should have a shoe next is everybody. (laughs) Now, if you know something that you think has been out of bounds worthy this season, let me know and I'll shout it out on the show. You can email us at hello at editaud.io. That's H-E-L-L-O at E-D-I-T-A-U-D dot I-O. Or check the show notes for all of this info. We got you. Rebound Revolution is an edit audio original podcast created in collaboration with The Cube. I'm your host, Money McEachern, and this episode was produced by Melissa Houghton, Mick Finnegan, and me. It was edited, mixed, and mastered by Mick Finnegan. Our supervising producer is Anna Deshawn. Our executive producer is Steph Colburn. Thank you to Kathleen Speckert and the whole edit audio team.